Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. All right, thank you. So I'm sorry it took a little minute to get started here and get back on, but um, I am recording this. So um, this will be a recorded session as well. You'll be posted on uh, YouTube for you. And so what I'd like to do is to finish up as much as we can here um, on lecture six, maybe go into seven, try to leave maybe about 15 minutes at the end. I think we only have about two or three possible presentations left. And then I'd leave it open to those folks to just screen share and then we'll finish up where we're at for that point. Uh, I would expect we're gonna get to more homework. And so now's the time to start planning on homework. When I finish up lecture seven, we'll be able to get into um, uh, the next lab quiz, but we are not near really at the point we need to be at for the next test. So I'm thinking we're probably going into the week of the 23rd or 25th for the next test. So, so give you a heads up as we're going right now. We just need to cover more content be, before we get to test point. So. So last time, I think we left off here um, talking, we had finished the earlier uh, slide and we're, we're moving on to this point. So can everybody see screening, see the screen? Is that correct? Just take it easy, bro. Yeah. I mean, nothing happened in class. Can you see a screen in front of you? Oh, they feel yep. All yep, it's a... Uh drift in building frames due yep. to lateral okay. loads. You're, you're seeing it. That's fine. Thank you. So lateral loads, um, obviously in high stress, produce sway movements and they'll cause vibration in buildings. Uh, it's important for structure to have sufficient strength against the vertical loads and adequate stiffness to resist those lateral forces as well. More tall and slender building footprints tend to be wind sensitive and wind forces applied to the exposed surfaces of the buildings uh, will create these forces. Generally, it's the long axis wall in the footprint that generates the most wind pressure force, not the smaller axis wall in terms of width or dimension. Remember, a seismic force is inertia. It results from the distortion of the ground and inertial resistance of the building in that sense the strong and weak axis conditions are not as evident as they are for wind in terms of where force originates and directionality. These forces can cause the horizontal deflection. That's called drift in a multi-story building. Lateral deflection is predicted movement of a structure under lateral loads and story drift is defined as the difference in lateral deflection between two adjacent stories. So we have tended to measure both total drift and interstory drift the reason for that is sometimes you can have a building that is safe for total drift, but it's possible there much there might be a very high live load, live load I'm sorry, seismic load at one level, and you're going to fail in interstory drift. And in that sense, you your project, your 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 building is is still failing. So seismic load applications, the uh, ASC E710 and IBC. 2012 um, allow for drift limits and generally for drift limits, they haven't changed much. It's roughly 2.5% of the total height of a story or 2.5% of the total height of the building. The limitations put in place, not merely for serviceability re re uh, reasons. That means it has safety implications as well. It's an inherent effort to, to current seismic design provisions that required to check, be checked to ensure safety. So in terms of what are some of the drift limits that we would typically see for buildings uh, re relative to wind, if you take a look at the chart on the right-hand side, this, this is coming from uh, one of the more current codes in terms of IBC or, or AS, ASCE and IBC drift limits. And if you see what they are, they apply to roofs, but they're also applied to exterior cladding and they're also applied to interior partitions. So in other words, you might be thinking about what will engineers evaluate. Well, they won't be just evaluating the frame drift or a story drift. 
they might be thinking about where the drift limit is applied to individual components and cladding. And the more brittle they are, the smaller the limit of drift they're going to have. The more flexible they are, generally they'll, they'll have a larger drift limit. So lateral deflection is displacements largely caused by these wind or seismic forces. To run through a basic quick evaluation, this is the old UBC technique, which is somewhat simplified compared to what we have today um, in terms of originating that force. We say, let's say lateral lift drift limits for wind are H over 400 or 0.0025H, where H is height. So seismic, we'd be at 2.5% as the drift limit. Delta M is the mass, maximum inelastic response displacement. That's measured where is 0.7 R times delta S, where R is our structural system coefficient value. It's unitless. And again, remember, we've seen these range UBC, IS, ASC, EIBC, roughly they're two point in the UBC calculation, they were from 2.8 to 8.5. 2.8 is not a good system. It's going to be fairly weak to resist lateral forces. 8.5 would be a, a stiffer system. Um, T is less than 0.7 seconds. Delta M is H over 200 at 0.005H. T is greater than 0.5 seconds. H over 250 or 0 0.00 or H. When a building is stiff, where T is less than 0.7 seconds, the allowable lateral deflection should be double that for wind as wind forces occur with greater frequency, but shouldn't exceed 0.005H. So an example here, an H is our building height. So for an example, we've got a building that's got an R value of 12, let's say it's very heavy system or stiff system. The T is 2.16 seconds. The building is 24 floors, five floors in height, the floor to floor height is 12 feet per floor. Our building period is greater than 0.7 seconds, so we're governed by 0 0.03 over R, or 0.03 divided by 12, or 0 0.0025, or less than 0 0.004. The interstory drift, that means one floor at uh, 12 feet, is 0 0.0025H, or 0 0.00 times 12 feet, times 12 inches. Drift is measured in inches. So whatever dimensions you have in feet, you will have to do a unit conversion to inches, and we have 0.36 inches. The reason it's measured in inches is the value is usually pretty small. You'll get used to use seeing decimal place values, in other words. Total drift limit at 25, 25 floors would be 0.36 inches times 25, or we'd have nine inches of total drift. So a building 25 story floors in height, a 12 feet floor to floor, it's possible that the difference between the drift that occurs on the on ground floor level and at the upper roof level could be as much as nine inches. So for wind force calculations um, for shear walls, this on the right-hand side is a sort of a quick one through of the engineering formulas that were developed that we'll be using for the drift calculation. So it says drift told is pH cubed divided by three EI. P is the force applied to that level. H is the height at which it's applied. Height is cubed. So notice drift is sensitive to height. The taller the building floor is or the taller the roof is, that value is cubed. It's going to have a pretty large amplification effect on the magnitude of drift. Three is a constant. E is a modulus of elasticity, whatever the building frame is made of. I is the moment of inertia, or sorry, the, the wall is made of, and I is the moment of inertia of the wall. The shear deflection at the top of the wall, 1.2 times pH divided by E times A again. A is the cross-sectional area cut through the wall. And F sub V, sorry, on the, on the denominator, that's the allowable shear stress that wall can undertake. Kips per linear feet or pounds per linear feet. Reformulating this, the total deflection of the cantilever is 4P times divided by E. Uh, I times multiplied by the quantity H over L cubed, but times 0.75 H over L. These two values, the H cubed over L plus 0.75 H over L respond to two conditions. The one on the left, H cubed over L is a bending force drift contribution. The one on the right is the shear force drift contribution. So in some cases, bending will dominate in some, and, and therefore you will drop out part of this equation. In some cases, there's no significant bending, it's dominated by shear. 
and you will have to use the shear portion of the side of the equation. And in some cases, it's significant enough that shear drift and bending drift have to be both at, uh, accounted for together, and so they'll both remain in. So the generic formula down below where delta is drift is P divided by E sub T, E modulus elasticity, lowercase t is the thickness of the wall, times H cubed divided by L times 3H divided by L. L is the wall length, H is the wall height. On the right-hand side, you can use feet rather than inches for H over Ls because they drop out. And essentially, the value is unitless. It's expressed as a ratio. You don't need to convert to inches. It just simplifies your math. And so that standard form in the red box there is what we're deriving our forms from, our, our formula for shear drift. And what does shear wall uh, conditions look like? Well, I'm going to take a look to jump over to the internet real quick, and I'll show you three sample walls that are going through test demonstrations to evaluate their shear effectiveness. First one on the left is a masonry shear wall. El Centro earthquake simulation was the magnitude. The one in the middle is a plywood shear wall test. It, it has a force applied to it. And the one on the far right-hand side is a steel panel wall test. The one on the right-hand side is a little different. Um, often the shear panels for steel are solid, thick uh, steel plates, typically anywhere from a quarter of an inch, maybe up to three quarters of an, uh, of an inch in thickness, depending upon the magnitudes. But this is actually corrugated metal, so you'll see it behaves a bit differently. It's not as rigid as solid sheet panels and steel. So give me a minute here. I'm going to try to grab these YouTube videos, and we'll stop, share, and reshare.
Okay, sorry, you should be looking at uh, YouTube video, but I see it, NIST motion. Yes? Okay. Had to get through the ads on YouTube. Sorry about that. Those wires in the background are um, strain sensor gauges. They're measuring the motion back and forth and how much the frame is distorting. Do you see the push going on as they simulate the earthquake? It's called a shake table test. Look at the uh, pillar in the, on the left-hand side by the door. Do you see the sort of X, X cracking condition there? That's that pattern of masonry failure that I talked about sort of an X pattern of either, you the, the pattern of failure through the shear wall is a diagonal. It's either going in tension or in compression. When you see the crack, it's a tension condition. Notice the failures on the lower level. Why would the failure be on the lower level? Is the, diaf is the diaphragm load larger on the lower level or smaller on the lower level? It's larger, right? Earthquake shifts downward. So that's where we are. Okay, uh, let me see if I can move to the next one for you. Okay. So here's the um, ply wall, a plywood wall that's being seen here. This is what's called flake board. It's not very strong, but it can be sufficient in um, stiffness to provide what's called a plywood shear wall. You can see the device on the upper right hand side. That arm is going to be pushing on the shear wall and it's going to be moving it back and forth in the direction of that sort of black plate that's connected to it. I'm going to move it along so we can start to see it move a little further. You can barely see that sort of pumping action going on the right hand side, but do you see it's moving back and forth? Very slow there. Uh, that piston arm there is pushing the wall back and forth. Let's move it a little faster. Everybody see it now? You see it? Yep. It's not failing. Notice there's the center panel of the uh, flake board. That's got to take shear. Um, kips per linear feet or pounds per linear feet. It goes through it. But there's boundary elements. There's the two vertical studs on either side, and there's the top uh, top piece as well. Those are the boundary elements. I want to let's keep looking at this. Let's see if we go further. You seeing a push here? See a little rocking action there as it pushes. 
All right, here we are. Do we let's take a keep an eye on this one. I want you to take a look at the upper right hand connection where the vertical studs connected to the top. Do everybody see that? What do you see happening across the top? Upper right hand side where the little vertical wood stop piece is going on. Keep an eye on that. This system is not failing in terms of the flake board failing. Do you see what's happening at that top connection? Upper top where that, that vertical stud on the right-hand side is at the edge of the board. Do you see it separating right there, right now? Anybody see it? There's a separation there. So this element is failing, not failing with unit shear through the flake board, but the boundary elements that are making up the shear wall just like there are boundary elements for a diaphragm in a roof or a floor, that separation is indicating the failure in the boundary element. It's just simply not strong enough to carry that load. Okay, let's go to the last one. Hold on. All right, can you guys see the motion going on back and forth video? Yes. So it's another shear device. You see the big piston arm on the upper right. That's what's pushing it back and forth. Take a look at those horizontal uh, rib elements in the panel system. Look at the color and the, and the motion, the uh, color shift you see going on. System is still hanging in there. It's probably still adequate at this point. But pretty soon you're going to start, you're hearing noises. Everybody hear the pops? System starting to fail away. And we failed. You see what's going on here? See the major distortions through the corrugation? Everybody see those? There's way too much motion there. The system's compromised. It's, 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 it's failing beyond the elastic limit at this point. And it's not able to provide the serviceability that's needed. Okay, so let's get back to the lecture. So there's our failure cases and our illustrations of how shear is working, shear walls are working. And so our general formula for these would be shown on the upper right-hand side. It says that our delta for, delta for drift is P divided by E sub T times H over L cubed plus 3H over L. Delta is my total drift. P is the wall thickness in inches. L is the effective length of the wall. That's basically the, the length of the wall itself in feet. P is the lateral force on top of the wall, typically measured in kips. Um, w is the uniform cantilever load. That can be in uh, PLF if, if, it's a, if it's a W load, but we're not using W. H is the wall height in feet, and G is referred to as the modulus of elasticity. So on the very top form, the simplified version of the equation is shown in the red box. P divided by E times T times H over, multiply H over L cubed plus 3H over L. 
Now you use this formula in three versions. If you take a look at the lower left-hand side, there is what's called an aspect ratio test. And these aspect ratios will determine whether or not you use the full formula or portions of it. So if you have a long low wall, that's a wall that's gonna be dominated by shear distortion and deflections, deformations. It's not gonna be dominated by bending related. So when L over H, the length of the wall, divided by the height of the wall where the force is applied. If that's greater than 1.5, you have a long low wall. The formula is P divided by E times T times three H over L. Units should be consistent. So P should be in kips and E should be in KSI. Uh, T would be in inches, but notice the H over L again is unitless because it's a ratio. We don't have to switch to inches. If the intermediate wall condition is in place, the intermediate wall would be on the right-hand side where H over L, I'm sorry, intermediate wall is where 0.67 is less than H over L and H over L is less than six. In this case, you have to use the full form. You have to use the distortion uh, available to bending as well as distortion available to shear. So you have, in this case, three, H over L cubed plus three H over L. If the wall is tall and narrow, this is not gonna be a good shear wall, shear wall profile, by the way, it's not desired. It's going to be a tall wall defined as a flexural cantilever. That means H over L is greater than six. In that case, you're dominated by H over L cubed. And again, these walls, these tend to exhibit the largest drift. Most buildings are gonna fit under the intermediate wall category of profile of aspect ratio or the long wall, and they will be better performing as a result. So let's take a look at these three examples. In the interest of time, and, and you know, I would have done this in class, but it's in the interest of time, um, I'm just gonna show you the, the solutions to walk, to walk through these because it's just difficult to do this inside of a, a Zoom format. So here we've got three wall profiles. Uh, they're all 13 feet in height. They all have a five kip load applied. Uh, the first one's 25 feet in, in, in length. The second one's 12 feet in length. And the third one's only two feet. So the first one, if we do our L over, uh, do our L over H profile check, we're gonna find the first one is three H over L for our value of Delta. And we're gonna have five kips divided by 2400 KSI times three times 12, uh, uh, sorry, 12 over 25. And that's gonna be our value 4.25 times 10 to the negative fourth. Now, what is our maximum limit for this wall? Well, if this is masonry, it's gonna have a fairly a low tolerance for drift. It's gonna be H over 2000 based on the charts that I was showing you earlier. So we'd have 13 feet times 12 divided by 2,000.878 inches. Our next one, that would be the intermediate wall. Uh, 13 by 12 is roughly one. So it's gonna meet the intermediate wall category. And so we're gonna have to work with the full formula. That's the one on the right-hand side, five kips divided by 2,400 KSI times 7.63 inches. That's our wall thickness. 1.08 cubed plus three times 1.08. We get 0 0.00123 inches. And if we move to the far right-hand side, we're gonna have P divided by ET H over L cubed. Working that one through, we should wind up with 0 0.0749 inches. So we're constantly moving our value here, 4.26 times 10 to the negative four was the smallest value. Now this one is starting to become larger. This one's even becoming larger. And you can see here on the far right-hand side, we're close to our limit. 0.078 is our limit. We're at port 0 0.075. So there's a pretty significant shift in magnitude and drift here. The long wall to the intermediate, intermediate to the tall wall uh, um, starts to being even more significant. And you can clearly see why these profile characteristics 
have an indication of how much drift. We like intermediate walls. Long walls are okay, but the problem is they're difficult to configure in most building profiles based on base sizes and story heights. Intermediate walls are more common. The long, narrow wall, not something we'd want. Shear wall design, by using shear wall frames can resist lateral loads. What's the approximate profile height to width of a shear wall? Uh, the literature and engineering would say H over H over W height to width about eight over 10. It's a fairly good, basically it's an intermediate wall. Um, examples of, of these sorts of shear walls on the far left, upper, upper right hand side. On the left, there's a solid steel sheet panel introduced inside that bay. That's a steel sheet uh, metal plate shear wall. On the right hand side, uh, the upper right hand side, there's a concrete shear wall for that building in the frame, in the concrete frame. And on the lower right hand side would be the plywood shear wall. So that we've seen that in the little test sample we did a moment ago. It's a solid sheet of plywood. It's in a wood frame. What you are seeing were the outer two vertical studs that made up that frame in the test sample. And then the two horizontal pieces were the other boundary to the shear wall, the top of the, at the upper ledge and then the bottom down below. Notice there are anchor conditions on the bottom of the shear wall. You have to have hold downs. In other words, what? how did our shear wall test fail in the video clip? It didn't fail on the bottom of the, of the stud, right? It failed on the top. Why? The, the hold down was keeping it from failing down there. And it also has to have what are called anchor bolts, these long shear bolts that you see on the bottom. Those are to stop the wall from shearing off the plane of the foundation or moving. If you're in a hurricane zone, definitely high wind zones, Florida, for example, light frame buildings will all have to have these sorts of support conditions. All right, let's take a quick look at a shear wall case. Uh, this is a building in footprint, you see it there, 100 by 60. We've got a 260 pound foot force applied to that. Excuse me, got the roof level. It's um, a transverse shear wall in the building. Uh, the studs are two by six Douglas for large. Walls are stucco construction on the outer edge. Shear capacity of the cement plaster would be 180 pounds. And the wall weighs three kips. And so our first check is how much is that total R value force? Well, we've got two. Uh, we've got 260 pounds per foot multiplied by 100 feet, and there's two shear walls on either end to the left hand side and to the right hand side of the plan that you see. And so, if we take that value and divide it by two for the two walls, we have 13 kips for the reaction on either side. So the upper right hand side section or wall elevation shows you the 13 kips. Arrow pushing to the left. What is our unit shear through the wall? Our unit shear would be 13,000 13, pounds converted to pounds divided by 60 feet. That's the wall length, 60 feet. So it's got a unit shear of 216.7 pounds per feet. The uh, cement plaster on the outside as the finish is only 180 pounds. So this isn't necessarily an indication that the shear wall would fail, but it's certainly an indication that the finished material on the outside can't withstand that force. So it's going to be cracking, and we have a problem with the finished material not being acceptable. Our overturning moment would be 13 kips times 16 feet. You can assume that's 1.5 modifier included, or 208 kip feet. The resisting moment summation moments at A, that's the overturning pivot point on the lower left side. Remember, the wall comes out of the ground on the right. It gets driven into the ground on the left based on the force, 13 kips from right to left. And so we have a 90 kip, for, kip foot force. Our uplift anchor, anchors must resist two, 208 minus 90 kip feet divided by 60 feet. That's the difference between the two uplift, if uplift anchors. One's on the left, one's on the right. And so those little metal anchors I showed you in the picture a moment ago for the wood shear walls, they have to hold down almost two kips, 1.97 kips in order for keeping this safe. Diagonal bracing looks something like this um, in most buildings. You can have a diagonal brace that's a simple, uh, solid, single diagonal through the bay like you see there. Notice the pins, the connections are basically pin connections in this basic steel frame. 
They don't need to be rigid connections because the triangulation provides the stiffness. You can have an X-brace condition. Now, X-braces are usually thin rods or high-strength steel cables. The reason you have to have two diagonals is because a diagonal tension element like a rod or a cable can only take tension forces. So if you reverse the directionality of a force on this frame, let's say pushing right to left or left to right, you're going to see that the diagonal brace, X brace, will have one element in compression and a second element in tension. Basically, the one in tension does all the work. The one in compression is assumed to buckle. Essentially, it's not doing the work. And so thin rods, cables, tension only, have to be X, race, X braced. But if you have a hollow tube that can take compression as well as tension, you would have the single diagonal brace that's on the upper right. So vertical bracing systems, brace frames, how do we evaluate them? Our generic formula looks something like this, pH cubed divided by three times E times summation of I sub C. E is the applied force, you see it on the upper right at the elevation of the top of the frame. H is the height of the frame. E is the modulus elasticity of what the frame is made of. I sub C is moment of inertia. And moment of inertia is for both the columns, the column on the left and the column on the right added together. That's why the summation for value is shown. So you would know the cross section, let's say, of the of the column element, and you'd know you could find its moment of inertia, or you could look it up in a, a table or a chart if it's a standard steel element. The axial tension in the diagonal force FD could be found by the following expression: delta D PL over AE divided. Uh, subscript D or F sub D times LE cosine theta, where delta two is equal to delta D divided by cosine theta or F sub D L divided by E cosine squared theta. Applying the lateral force limits, we would say pH divided by EA D cosine squared times sine theta is less than H over 400. Putting this to work on a left-hand side example, Diagonal force uh, is 80 kips at P. It's an A36 steel. The drift limit is set to H over 400. It's a typical wind, wind level drift limit. We have a six by six by 0 0.037 uh, diagonal brace hollow tube. The length is 8.75 feet. Its cross-sectional area is 5.08 inches squared. Its section modulus xy is 13.9. Its radius duration xy is it's square, so it's symmetrical. So those values are the same, 2.27 inches. Um, A36 steel, our uh, uh, failure strength and uh, tension would be 0.6 Fy or 21.6 KSI. Our slenderness ratio KL over R is 1.0. You might not remember this, but you may remember it from either intermediate structures when you studied steel columns for buckling or in basic structures, you studied you study the generic formula for buckling. K is the stiffness parameter associated with the frame system. A frame system that's completely pin connected with a diagonal brace has a K of one. Um, when does K get larger than one or less than one? When stiffness is added to the frame. So if I have rigid connections, no diagonal brace, K will be larger than one because the frame is more flexible and it's going to drift. If I had um, a system where I had more stiffness, let's say, I don't know, um, por partially rigid connections and diagonal bracing, K is going to be less than one because there's more stiffness added. L is my unreinforced length of the diagonal brace. That's the 8.75 feet. And remember, for unit consistently, consistency, I've got to multiply by 12. My radius of gyration, remember, is in inches, uh, so it's 2.27 we have 46.26. Now I'm gonna tell you that we're, how do we get to F sub A? That's based on a chart or a table. You can find it in the steel manual. Um, if you have your steel manual references from intermediate structures, or maybe there's a steel manual buckling table chart in your textbook. There was a, a, a um, buckling chart reference for, for steel columns in the basic structures textbook. And so based on the slenderness ratio of 46.26, one would look up in this table or chart, it's easy to read, the allowable stress and tension would be 18.6 KSI. 
With E as our modulus elasticity at 29,000 KSI, H is 12 feet, L is 25. Tangent uh, theta for the angle of inclination of the diagonal brace is 12 over 25. The cosine is 0 0.902. We have FD times L, E cosine squared theta. We have 18 KSI. We're setting that, setting that up as our upper limit for allowable stress. We're figuring in the actual um, formula here, the 25 times 12 divided by in feet. And we're dividing it by E, the 29,000 uh, KSI. And in this case, what did we plug in? We plugged in our cosine value squared and we get 0.23 inches. So in a sense, what we did is we plugged into the formula, slightly modified it. We plugged in our allowable stress limit and it basically was testing if we are okay. Um, we are allowed 0.36 inches for the deflection for this, H over 400, converted to inches for height. And we're at 0.23 inches, so we're okay. Um, we could check maybe a slightly different value if we were a size member if we wanted to. Um, if we wanted to check this for efficiency, um, this is our check for efficiency down below. Um, checking our value for efficiency, we wind up with about 85% efficient. That's not bad. That's a fairly efficient section. Getting less than that would be less desirable. On the right-hand side of just working through this problem for this problem on the right, graphic on the upper right-hand side, H is 15 feet, FD is 18 KSI. So I already gave you the, this, the stress limit of the diagonal brace. Didn't express it in terms of P. We didn't do the slenderness ratio calculation. Uh, L for the horizontal um, span width is 17 feet. Our data value, theta value for the angle of inclination is 42.242 degrees. We can do the, the math and cosine is 0.75. Delta is 18 KSI times 17 times 12 divided by 29,000 times the 0.75 squared or it's 0.225. Our maximum drift, again, H over 400 would be 0.45. We're pretty safe here at 0.225. We're probably... As you can see, only using 50% of the drift allowed. It might be something like this could have been a smaller cross-section, possibly, um, to be more efficient. So lateral bracing configurations in these systems look something like this. Single-story frames, multi-story frames um, can be braced. You notice in the multi-bay system on the lower left-hand side, you're not bracing every bay. You're only, you're only bracing the center bay. And the reason for that is if there's a load applied to the left or a load applied to the right from wind, or if it's an earthquake load, eventually those columns in those um, beams are going to transfer the load back to the center diagonal bay. The center diagonal bay will do all the work. So the two end bays are not braced. They do not need to be. Um, if you have a diaphragm in a roof that's not sufficiently stiff enough to be considered rigid or flexible, you'd have X bracing in them. And so light framed steel roofs that you might've seen, let's say in an ID3 project, when you're using steel framing, if there was no concrete topping on the corrugated metal decking, but just insulation, these sorts of frames typically had X bracing in the roof diaphragm. And on the right-hand side, various configurations of these truss frameworks, um, they're also called lattice frameworks or lattice structures are shown on the right-hand side. On the lower right-hand side, sort of a typical kind of portal frame mill building. It has diagonal brackets on the two end columns that are also giving an additional support for lateral loads. So brace frames in steel look something like this. They're generally concentric, uh, meaning in a lower moderate earthquake or wind zone, you'll see them typically coming together with the diagonal brace at the column beam connection, but they can be eccentric as well. So you see the V, or the inverted V, the K-bracing um, conditions. Um, the K-bracing condition is not a good one for seismic because it still puts a failure point on the column. But on the lower right-hand side, the inverted V or the V-brace, that's better for earthquake because the failure condition is now the beam, but not the column.
Eccentric brace frames incorporate a del deliberately controlled eccentric brace connection. The eccentricity in the late link or beams are carefully chosen to prevent buckling of the brace, provide a ductile me mechanism for energy absorption. So these elements are almost like uh, uh, what they call um, lateral force fuses, um, almost like a shock absorber. In other words, they're designed to, to absorb energy. You don't have to take them apart unless they truly fail, they generally can, can, can last some fairly high uh, load conditions and they can remain in place for longer periods of time. So lattice work and diagonal bracing systems takes different configurations. Simple diagonal, not a high seismic zone, cross spacing A and B. They can be rhomboid light lattices as well. Um, in the case of the uh, E, F or D lower left, those would probably be more of an earthquake seismic force condition where you do not want a failure at a column. You want that fuse condition to be in the girder. Cross bracing like G and H, again, could be more traditional non-seismic magnitude loads. The H condition is referred to as a hat truss, meaning the roof level frame of the building is additionally diagonally braced to add stiffness in the frame. This is used typically when buildings get taller. You might see this, what's called hat truss configuration. Sometimes it's not at a roof, it's at a particular floor in a high-rise building, for example. Um, elevation of a wall with a diagonal, obviously, when you need to have clear height through a doorway, you have to position doorways so that you can move them. Uh, you can introduce an opening. Sometimes diagonally bracing, diagonal bracing is in the more convenient, smaller base because they use less material, as you can see here in the M value. Sometimes a very high seismic zone may have enormous diagonal braces on the outer wall. Maybe California, we would see this, or an N or an O. Um, the other diagonal bracing system is sometimes referred to as a staggered truss. These are um, trusses that go full floor. They go from uh, the top core of the truss would be the, um, uh, the, let's say this case would be the roof. The bottom core of the truss would be the, the floor down below. And they literally pass, the vertical web members are literally passing through regions from the floor to the floor above to the floor below, or the roof to the floor below in this case. They are altered on the bay. So in the case of the top row, a column would be here, a column would be here with the staggered truss, but there would also be a column line right here. And on the floor below, the staggered truss, the truss element is there. They're staggered because they even out the distribution of the force resistance for the lateral wind loads or earthquake loads. There are examples of those in real buildings. All right, let's suppose we're gonna look at a quick diagonal force check condition for stiffness and stability. Here we've got a three-story building. It's 20 feet, 35 feet, 50 feet. There are three bays, 30 feet, each from A to B and B to C and C to D. Um, let's say you've done your wind load calculation or your earthquake load calculation. You've got 68 kips, 130 kips and 89 kips. Uh, what happens if this is a um, pin-connected frame? Well, the force originates at A, column line A. It's going to put all the, the horizontal girders that you see in elevation in compression as it pushes the force over to column line B because the connections at A are not rigid. They're just pin connections. And the bay is not triangulated. It cannot resist any load. So it goes from being vertical to a rhomboid. When it hits, the force hits column line B, then the diagonal brace are, base, base are there and the diagonal braces are there. These would be thin rods because they're X braces. And the work gets done between B and C. So on the upper right-hand side is your free body diagram. The six A kips moves over to B through the compression force from the girder AB. 130 kip moves over at column line B. The 89 kip force moves over at B. And we're looking at our diagonal forces. So if we take a look at the um, uh, braced center bay condition um, on grade, 
what is going to be our total x-axis force resistance needed at the lower, very lowest level? Well, we have 68 kips, 130 kips, 89 kips, minus the resistance force on lower level, ax is zero. We've got 287 kips going through if we consider the uh, largest force condition being on ground. But let's suppose we take a look at upper levels. Let's suppose we look at this upper level here. And I create a section, uh, a free body diagram. I cut the system off down below here. And now I'm only looking at the top portion of this frame from here to here and the two X braces. One of these two diagonals by definition will have to be tension. The other one will be compression. If the frame looks like this, and then the force is applied and it goes like this, does everybody understand why the red line is in tension? That diagonal increases in length geometrically, right? If the frame distortion is like this, sorry, I'm gonna do an annotation for you. The frame distortion goes this way. Everybody follow me? Yeah. This element would now just be transposed to this condition and it's stretched. This one would not be stretched because the point B is moving towards C. This one would be compressed. Does that make sense? So we know the red diagonal is the one that's in tension. There are two force force conditions that are that are possible now in the tension element. No. The vertical force would go down, and the x-axis force must go the, to the left. That's how this element can be stretched. Everybody agree? No. So what is my x-axis force magnitude here? Well, yeah. I'm sorry, what is our total, our x-axis force magnitude would be the 68 kips, correct? My diagonal force would be the ratio of uh, the, the long the, the hypotenuse value, 2.236 from the upper right, divided by two, that's the horizontal dimension between B and C and the diagonal, which is the diagonal brace dimension. That ratio multiplied by 68 kips gives me 76.02 kips. So we have 76.02 kips up here being my diagonal tension force. If we were to go to the uh, next level and we were to cut this here, we agree the same condition in the free body diagram exists. Tension is still lower left to upper right. But how much force is acting at that level? It's 130 kips plus 68 kips. 198 kips divided by 30 equals our diagonal force divided by 33.5 feet. That would be its actual inclined length. So we get 221.4 kips. And that would be our value here. Now, what would you think is going to happen in this diagonal brace? Is it going to increase or decrease? It's going to increase, right? Why would it increase? Well, we already know that that X component factor for that diagonal brace is the 287 kips. So by the time we break this down, we're obviously going to get a value probably in the 300 range for the diagonal force. Yeah. Does this make sense? Yes. Why? Lateral loads are cumulative. They'll be less at the top, increasing at the second floor, or less at the third floor, increasing at second floor, maximum as we get to the grade level. So they give you a all right, let's take a look at um, our last evaluation. So we've looked at diagonal bracing. We've figured out how to measure force magnitudes, but we've also figured out how to measure drift conditions in diagonal bracing and set them against a drift mm -hmm. limit. Mm -hmm. We did our shear wall check. Right. We figured out how to apply a shear, warf, shear, well, shear wall force to a, a, a lateral force to a shear wall. We figured out how to measure its drift condition. It's varied based on the aspect ratio, how to measure it against a drift limit. Mm -hmm. Our last one will be a rigid bay. So 
in this case, we're going to have the significant amount of drift here. Um, and the condition that you would see here is most commonly seen, for example, in steel portal frames. So here in the case, you're actually seeing two sort of portal frame vets. You'll see the the major portal frame, which is the gray one, and it's got a rigid connection between the beam and the column. But on the other side, in the small, the smaller bay, the difference between them, normally that's X bracing for stiffness in the frame, but it can also be another form of rigid frame. And you see the small red rigid frame is the other bracing condition in the long axis. So taking a look at examples of drift configuration, here's our force P. P is equal to R sub F divided by uh, times delta, which is our resisting force. And P is equal to 17 EI sub C divided by H cubed times delta. Delta is our total drift limit that we can have. I sub C is a moment of inertia of one column. Limiting stiffness conditions in the frame exhibits a quality, a quality of relative stiffness in a beam. Now, what does relative stiffness mean? In this case, it would be measured and understood this way. The moment of inertia divided by the length of the beam is roughly the same as a ratio value to the moment of inertia of the column divided by the height of the column. And meaning that means there's not really stiff beams and weak columns or really stiff columns and weak beams. They're about of equal stiffness. This formula can apply when this sort of relative condition of stiffness is, is present. For our formula or our problems, whether they're lab or whether they are a homework problem, will it, the relative stiffness will be evident and, impl and, and basically implied. Uh, let's check a problem with, um, for our case, this problem on the right problem here, our delta Drift limits H over 400, typical wind drift. I sub C is 2,000 inches to the fourth. Um, e is 2,400 KSI. H is 13 feet. And um, our, um, our formula set where 17 is a constant is multiplied through. Please note, we've got inches for all the units and kips. KSI for our I sub C, our height and moment of inertia are, are inches. And our value is 13 feet times 12 inches in the denominator. And we wind up with, with 13 feet divided, 13 feet times 12 inches over 400. That's setting it as our drift limit. So we have, as we calculate our values, we essentially embedded our drift limit in the denominator. And we have 0.39 there as our drift limit check down below meaning that what is the force that we can accept? We can accept 8.3 kips, eight kips, and we will not, will not exceed our drift limit. It's a pretty straightforward calculation. All right, earthquake resistant design concepts, what do they look like? So one, one of the two teams in this next lab is gonna be dealing with an earthquake or seismic evaluation for the building that you're gonna be designing. So this is probably a couple of slides you wanna remember. Um, this is basically from risk management um, uh, reference designed by FEMA for engineers and architects. It shows you the type of system on the left-hand side, what the material is made of, how it's characterized, masonry wall, timber framing, et cetera, steel moment resisting frame. The seismic R coefficient that you would find in your typical codes like IBC or, or ASC current codes. Nonlinear drift, medium to collapse, that in a sense meaning it's not necessarily consistent. Cyclic behavior, how it oscillates back and forth, meaning it's potentially unstable. Why? Because it's normally going to fail in a tension condition. Unreinforced masonry is not good. Obviously it can't take tension condition. Energy dissipation is low. While it has mass and self-weight, it, because it's gonna fracture under uh, tension conditions, it fractures relatively soon. And remember the El Centro earthquake? We showed you with the concrete walls, right? Those were breaking pretty fast. So it really can't absorb much energy. As soon as it goes into tension, it fractures. And 
post equation repair costs would be high. It's a lot. It's going to cost a lot to dismantle it and fix it and put in put a new one in place. And so these are all described down below. Um, the higher the the R value, probably you will see that the better performance is going to be exhibited because the system generally um, can absorb more loads and behave uh, more effectively to resist loads. And so these are the categorizations of the various systems and materials. And again, continuing with this, um, notice in this case, you are seeing a dual system on the very top. Uh, masonry shear wall with um, reinforced concrete moment resisting frame. So you've got a shear wall and moment resisting frame adding together. Notice the R value is pretty high at 5.5. Five. Uh, your best systems, you can see about 8.5 and 7.0. Your ductile steel moment resistant frame at 8.5. Energy absorption is good. Um, ability to uh, have a, a large ductility is good. So these are going to perform well. Um, steel eccentric brace frames are also doing pretty well as, as well. Okay, homework. Um, Number one, revise example two by changing the system to use masonry shear walls, adding a floor, same height and weight. Recompute diaphragm loads to shear walls, R is 4.5. Revise the brace frame problem in example four, change the height to 20 feet. Everything else stays the same, recompute results. Check a masonry shear wall for delta max. If the upper limit is H over 400, ease 2400 KSI, wall is 7.25 inches thick. Wall height's 12 feet, L is 15 feet. The lateral load applied at the top is 20 kips. Recalculate the rigid frame in an example six, but change I, C, I sub C to 1300 inches to the fourth only. When you recalculate, what is the total impact that this has on the allowable P load? And the next one, change only H to 16 feet, leave the I sub C as it was. What impact does height have on the maximum load applied? So look at the importance, relative importance of those two parameters, which one will matter more. Uh, there's a couple of web-based lectures. If you're interested, you can find them. Uh, they're dealing with these, these authors are you know, typically engineers, architecture faculty, and they're explaining these force conditions. Uh, homework problem five. Um, I think we did not, we did not um, um, issue this one because we did not have the shear wall portion check available. So if I remember, we need to issue this one and you've got to check your shear wall down below and you've got to check the drift on that shear wall based on its parameters for E and for T. I think we did issue correct six, right? We were able to do that one last time. So that's been done. All right, so that's it for lecture six. Um, I have a few more minutes left. We'll try to get started in lecture seven um, and then we're going to stop and see who do we have for the... Uh, um, remaining. Quizzes. Just give me a moment to grab your lecture seven and get started. No. Okay, let's take a look. All right, lateral force, lateral force and system analysis are topics, lateral force system types, brace frames, shear walls, rigid frames, seismic eccentric brace frames, portal method of analysis, cantilever method of analysis, issues of configuration, diaphragm stiffness and shear wall shape, and example problems with diaphragm loads and shear wall loads. So if we take a look at a rigid portal frame, I want you to make a few observations. And the reason I want you to do this is because when we apply this 
technique to a net to analyzing a, a rigid portal frame, there are an inherent number of assumptions that are built into the formula. And these slides illustrate why these assumptions essentially can be considered valid or correct. So on the upper left-hand side, you have a rigid portal frame. All the connections between beams and columns are rigid. You've got three kips, three kips, and three kips as a lateral force. The frame distortion would be what you see on the lower left, right? Everybody sees the frame is distorting to the right-hand side. This is a finite element analysis program. And the exaggeration, these, these distortions are exaggerated. Usually there's a magnification of factor of 20 so that they can be seen. Um, on the upper right-hand side, um, I did the display of the moment diagram, and I want you to see what's going on with the beams and the columns. What happens when a moment, di a moment diagram goes to zero in a member? When a moment diagram goes to zero in a member, it can have a pin connection at that point, correct? It doesn't need to resist rotation. So take a look at what you're noticing in the beams. Do you notice in the beams roughly the mid-span of the, of the beams have a point of inversion going to zero for a moment. You see the red dot that I've introduced there? Look at the columns right below it. You see the point of inversion of the moment diagrams on the columns? They're roughly the mid-height of the columns. Everybody see that? What does that mean? In, the, in order to analysis, analyze a portal frame, there's too much stiffness and rigidity here. We have too many indeterminate values and problems that we'd have to solve for what's called is a substitute pin analysis. That means I can insert a pin at the mid-height of a column and insert, insert a pin at the mid-height of a beam. I cannot compromise, I will not compromise stability in doing so, but it will be easier for me to analyze the frame or us to analyze the frame. The shear, di shear diagram is shown on, down below, and I want you to pay attention to my column loads. What do you see for the column loads? Do you see the uh, magnitude shift in uh, column shears? Uh, notice at the very top, column shears are small, correct? Go down to the set the, go down to the center. If they're getting larger, they're getting largest. Why? Lateral loads are cumulative again. Loads have to get transmitted from up above to the blade. Look at the uh, shear, di shear diagram magnitudes between the outer columns left and right and the middle columns in the center bay. Would you agree that not the same in magnitude? Clearly, the inner columns are carrying a larger percentage of the load. And roughly speaking, graphically, I think it's not unfair to say that the magnitude variation from outer to exterior is about a factor of two. The middle column shear magnitude is about twice as large in the, di in the diagram than the ones on the end base. And take a look down below at axial floats, forces. Um, the axial loads going through the columns. What do we notice about the two center columns? Axial loads in columns. Do you notice the columns don't have any axial forces? Does everybody see that? They're straight purple. There's no blue lines being shown here. Everybody see that? You're in here. Where are the axial loads going? Overturning forces are on the end columns to the left and to the right. Everybody see it? So effectively, axial loads relative to column lateral forces and rigid frames, we can ignore any resistance by the internal columns for overturning. All the work will be done on the two outer edge columns. Of course, the largest magnitude axial load is on the ground. Why? Again, cumulative force distribution, they're always going to be larger. Okay, uh, so we're at about seven o'clock. Um, uh, give me, a, we'll just give me a couple of minutes here and then we'll get to the remaining quiz problems, their quiz, uh, lab quiz presentations. Moment frames, what's their positive features? They're unobstructed braces. You just simply have a connection at the top of the beam or the top and bottom of the column, the beam. We don't have to worry about any kinds of interruptions in space planning. Good, good. They have favorable ductility if detailed properly, and also if the material itself is strong and has ductility. So, for example, steel. Performance is sensitive to detailing and workmanship of connections. Moment frames, their negative features, expensive, 
lots of material plus labor. You know, they're welded, they have to be done on site. They're not something that could be prefabricated easily and then just bolted to connection on bolted together on site. Low stiffness, um, <clears throat> large deflections can lead to high non-structural damage in earthquakes. Undamaged structure with all glass broken or finished is cracked. Those could be potential problems. If we take a look here, um, here's an X-brace frame. Um, and you've got the X-brace frame shown here. It's got the same height configuration as the rigid frame I showed you a moment ago. Same loads on the upper left-hand side. And here's its distorted distortion value here. And you remember we just did the problem earlier when we transmitted loads from here on the upper left-hand side of the frame to the right-hand side where the diagonal bracing was. Here's the axial compression force at the top moving to this column line. Here's the axial compression force here moving to this column line. The axial compression force here moving to this column line. <coughs> and where is all the work being done? Do you see any forces on the right-hand side column at all? Far right? There's no loads there. In fact, you don't even see any forces on the beams, right, on the far right-hand side bay. It's all zero. Center bay does all the work. Diagonal force tension across the top. Increased on the second floor and maximum on the ground floor. And the column axial loads are again doing all the work as these loads get transferred through. Base frames, positive characteristics, high strength and stiffness. Brace frames will have lower drift associated with them than rigid frames. Higher initial strength and stiffness. Bracing is more effective than rigid joints at resisting frame racking and cyclic loading. They're efficient and economical. Brace frames are generally considered to use less material and have simpler connections. Compact brace frames can lead to lower floor to floor heights. That can be an important factor in a taller building. Visual braces could be a strong negative or positive element or expression. Brace frame negative features, they can be obstructive. They'll interfere with uh, windows or door locations. Low ductility. Um, brace frames do generally have not, not much energy absorption um, under cyclic loading and they oscillate back and forth. Uh, one of the problems with them is you have diagonal braces going into compression. They start to buckle, can start to buckle fairly, fairly low loads. Uh, essentially, in a diagonal brace frame, though, you've always got the tension element there uh, through one of the two braces, so they have more um, reserve capacity and more stiffness as a result. Cores and shear walls. So this is, let's say, an earthquake or masonry shear wall infill. This was the same model I showed you before. And you notice there's not much movement going on at all. Um, this is the shear wall in the center bay. As the loads get applied, we're seeing some distortion here as the frame is being pushed to the right. <coughs> but these compression forces, again, are just moving over to the shear wall line of column here. The shear wall stops everything. And the shear wall transmitters loads to the ground again. And notice you're not seeing that much deflection at all here, lateral drift at all. That's because shear wall is the systems are the most stiff. They're going to have the most resistance. Low level stress is pink and purple. High level stress would be um, ax, uh, would be in the, the red, orange color. Small shear wall stress here makes sense. It's the upper level, higher magnitude here. It's, it's, it's got to carry both floors. Higher magnitude here, it's got to carry both upper floors. Shear wall characteristics look something like this. Um, in many cases, they're often bearing walls. Shear wall under lateral load only. Uh, this is another finite element analysis model of a shear wall, kind of like what I have, but there's gradations of tension and compression shown in this um, finite element model visualization. So tension is pink on the lower left. Why? Because as we said before, the wall wants to come out of the ground here, it's pulled. It's compressed into the ground here, therefore there's the blue, that's the compression. And we get into lower stress, re lower stress regions in the middle. Under a gravity load condition, as you can see here, loading the floors. Um, we don't have as much tension here or minimal tension here. Predominantly, we're switching to all compression. And on the right-hand side, you've got shear wall gravity plus lateral. And in a sense, some of these start to offset, but they also magnify. In other words, on the right-hand side, this is the load effects issue that we talked about in lecture three. 
compression due to gravity loads plus overturning compression forces are increasing compression on this side of the wall on the lower right. But what happens on the lower left? We had some tension over here. Then we switched, started to go over to compression here under gravity. But now with tension, uh, the tension has gone away. Largely, we're into the low stress region because the magnitude of gravity loads is counteracting the tension force on the wall. Seismic forces look something like this as a pounding effect problem. So in this case, this tall building next to this building starts to create pounding effect. Let me see if I can show you this model. This is a finite element model I made. Left-hand side building, low law, low uh, height system. Uh, it's got a soft first story. That's not a good thing if you remember that term. And um, on the right-hand side is a diagonally braced taller building, but it's got diagonal bracing and a half truss, and it's going to be stiffer. Everybody see the problem of pounding effect? The frame on the left-hand side clearly is running into the frame on the right-hand side. Uh, low first story frameworks again. Um, here's a failure in Olive View Hospital, Southern California, I believe. Uh, the low first story floors, this is a much stiffer wall panel up above, much less here because it's all glass. That starts to show failure. Obviously, a lot more deformation going on at the uh, on the lower level than there is on the upper level. And I showed you those uh, seismic um, fuse conditions before. Here's a FEA model again of this. This is the same force conditions as before. And the forces are applied. The deformation of the frame is kicking in. And on the very bottom, I have the moment forces. That's the blue diagram that you see there. Where are all the moment force resistance occurring? Everybody see right here, here, and here on that right-hand side? So this is the seismic fuse concept that keeps the force away from the column. Watch the little watch the motion in this distorted frame as a result of that load. Do you see that motion mechanism there? Is it rocked back and forth? That's the seismic fuse. That's what's going to have to do all the work. That's the shock absorber, if you will. Now notice this portion of a system also doesn't carry gravity loads. In other words, the floor joists of the roof purlins are parallel to it. So what that means is if this fails and it has to be replaced, it's permanently damaged, you can take this piece out and do not have to worry about a floor collapse, meaning it can be taken out and it can be replaced. So that's how the replacement cost in the event of damage goes down. It's, it's, it's less expensive to do that. Uh, the same condition here is the eccentric brace. What's happening in the middle right here? And here's our, you see the same basic mechanism in the middle. And, um, you know, this is where the energy is getting absorbed, but this is also where the system is. All right, um, I'll stop there because we're going to get into a much longer problem and we need some time. So I'll stop at this point. Um, and I'm, I'm going to invite those folks that have some outstanding lab quizzes to present. I know we've got some out there. Um, can I get somebody to step up? A couple of you to step up, two or three of you to step up, please. Yeah, we can go first, me and Elizabeth. Okay, please hit the screen share on the the green on the lower on the bottom. Hit your screen share button, and then make sure that we see your your presentation, please. I'm kind of cut. I don't know. Uh, I'm seeing kind of a cutoff. On, yeah, there we go. We're better. Go ahead. Um. So our building was the Saint Clair Mosque in um in Seville, Turkey. Um. So what is the structural system employed in materials used? The mosque uses concrete beams to support to support the sanctuary ceiling. Dad. Uh,
Um, and then the exterior cladding is masonry and then it has a moisture ah. barrier and then a curtain wall. The doors and windows is um, metal frame, glazing glass, and then entrances is um, a type of wood that is native to uh, Turkey. And then they also have wood doors. How does it function or what is the load path? Uh, the load path on um, the top exterior from the gravity and the earth sediment and it travels downward onto the roof. Since it is one floor, the interior load is from furniture, materials, people, um, et cetera, like the dynamic loads. And that travels downward, leftward and rightward. And then on the entrance facade on the exterior, the load travels rightward due to similar dynamic loads. And then we also have a uh, earth roof. So um, those also tra uh, travels downward. Uh, the system was employed um, due to the accessibility, the pathways and the journey, um, noise, and then the interior use of the building. Uh, so the mosque is a religious, it, it's used for religious purposes. Um, and so the idea of the interior space was to have it open, nice and calm. And then it allows for worshipers to kind of have that open space to um, do their religious practices. Um, the idea of it being embedded, um, the worshipers walk through one of the two openings in a four foot high slate clad wall and into the courtyard on the upper portion of the property. Um, so this just kind of like has a, a correlation to um, their religious practices and the journey that they go on in order to um, practice those, um, <laughs> their religion. Uh, and then what size, shape, configuration of the building. Uh, the mosque was designed to challenge long held ass assumptions and popular image. Um, so a lot of the mosque in Istanbul, Turkey, um, they are typically like a certain shape or a certain dimension. Um, and the architects of the Sinclair Mosque, they wanted to uh, push the abilities while also keeping um, Inappropriate for a religious sanctimony. And then uh, the types of connections that we believe that they use for rigid connections. The structure of the mosque is hidden behind the stepped concrete ceiling with no visible columns within the space. Um, and so at first we did think that it was a different type of, um, we, well, we actually thought it was trusses that yeah. were used. Um, on the building, however, uh, once we kind of looked deeper into the sections and then also various images um, that they had available, we noticed that you could see a beam kind of like traveling um, longitudinal um, above the ceiling and then they used uh, monolithic collections to uniformly uh, support the beam. With, with this structural system or the project as a whole, uh, rigidity is found uh, kind of in its monolithic stature being completely cast in place concrete along with the, the beams that go into the ceiling. And also it being situated in the earth gives it that extra stability that freestanding buildings don't necessarily have. Um, and then when it comes to the uh, electrical and mechanical HVAC and cooling systems, everything is tucked above the ceiling in that little, the little, um, a little negative space and you can see here there's a little space for uh, the ducts to kind of go underneath so you don't have to necessarily drill or cut any holes through the beams uh, and that's to kind of keep this very smooth and seamless interior uh, and the, you can kind of see the contour an interesting fact is the contours of these lines stem from outside and transition into the building and then transfer onto the ceiling which is an interesting fact. And then here to the right, we have the tributary area load and calculations. So um, in terms of how it was constructed, as I previously mentioned, it's all cast in place. This is not a building that is meant to be modular or relocated. It is planted in the earth and is very, very permanent um, and the, it, it did well in integrating with the site, and that was one of the main fundamental tenets of the project itself. Um, and in terms of structure, 
relating to daylight um there is one very important main it's kind of the main attraction or main feature of the worshiping area here in the top right corner you can see kind of like this heavenly light coming down from a skylight um and within that same channel is where the beams connect so there's a picture you can kind of see here in this bottom middle photo where the beam extends so the structure is muted so then all the focus is on one the daylight and then the very muted materiality of the interior which is just slate and concrete and then wood in some areas but it's very lightly used and then that same palette transfers outside um, to create a very seamless transition as users come from outside and then enter into the inner sanctuary um, but yeah the the palette is very is very restrained but strategically so to create that integrated experience from exterior to interior Okay. All right. Thank you. I have a couple questions. Um, um, I mean, I, first of all, I, I would say this is kind of a person whose architecture is something that uh, his work is something that you would probably want to study. This is a, an interesting project and its merits in a lot of ways, particularly site integration. Um, I heard the word precast concrete used in the beginning, but then I hear you saying by Elizabeth, but then I hear you saying cast in place. What am I mistaken here? What am I missing? you know saying something to that right right everything i found was pretty much so there in. says there's the word precast concrete beams on the right hand side under general notes right okay yeah right so i i mean maybe maybe it's correct or maybe it's not but i think when someone says everything's cast in place and i see a precast note i'm just trying to figure out right you know what i'm saying um i i'm pretty sure that like um all of the walls that were so all of the uh cast in place information they actually had a site where they listed um all of the um like materials within the building that they used and how they um whether they poured it or whatnot and i think the walls were poured in place, but the beams itself were pre-casted. Um, so based off so of did what they, they use had, that term pre-cast to describe beams? Or did you imply that? I'm, I mean, there might be some type of translation difference between the language. Okay. I'm really not sure. That's It's based off of the information that they had provided um with the materials okay well it's been if, if they said precast in english that's fine i would believe that the precast elements would could make sense here because of long span and obviously because it's earth integrated cast in place would make sense right because you don't want seams and joints and something that's earth integrated because you don't want water infiltration you know what i'm saying that's why you typically have cast in place um, what was an uh, for your perceptions? Any particular interesting salient points that interested you? I think for me personally was the level of I don't know if you can hear baby crying in the background. I apologize. I can. <laughs> okay, uh, but I think the just the the overall site integration. I have not seen a project that's done it this well and seamlessly. Like it, it feels like it absolutely belongs where it is, and it it was already there. And then how it transitions from that exterior to interior, it's, it's very seamlessly integrated. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, we do have not too many minutes. Do, does another team want to go today? Has it gone before? Um, Sarah and I can go if we have time. I mean, it's 719, but if you want to go, I mean, I'm you know, it's not that we have a commute to worry about today, so I'm willing to stay on. Okay, yeah, we can just get it over with. It looks like everybody's home, so you're not running to another class. Okay. Okay. 
So we had the School of Engineering at Lancaster University. Um, for the structural system that was employed and the materials used, um, it's comprised of concrete framing and GRC framing, which is interspersed with panels of textured brick, perforated, anodized aluminum panels, and then floor to floor or floor to ceiling glass. Um, as for the load path and how it functions, it appears to be made up of a flat plate framing system. So the loads are transferred from the slabs to the columns down to the lower levels and then down to the ground. Uh, as for why the system was employed, um, it was made to accommodate an expanding cohort of staff and students at Lancaster University and to make for an environment that could house a wide range of workshops, laboratories, and academic ops offices. And then one of the main goals was to build a highly sustainable facility that achieves BREAM outstanding. Uh, as for the size, shape, and configuration of a building, it's comprised of two 60-meter long wings that are separated by a six-meter wide central atria, which engages with the landscape to create a new public forecourt adjacent to the spine at one end, and then a similar scale service and delivery yard directly accessed via the perimeter road at the other end. And then the heaviest mechanical and engineering workshop spaces occupy the ground floor, while the upper levels consist of the smaller lab spaces and the academic and support spaces. Um, as for the connections used, um, it's likely bolted and or welded connections that are being used because the structural system is made up of concrete members. Uh, hello, just checking if you can hear me. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so how is rigid rigidity provided in the system? Um, so from what I saw, rigid, rigid Rigidity is provided in the system by use of rigid connections throughout the building. Um, these can be seen at some of the connections from the concrete column to the floor slabs. Um, also, there is a couple of central staircases as cores, which are providing shear resistance to the building. Okay, sorry. Okay, and then how does the system integrate mechanical and electrical or enclosure elements in the design? So lighting and mechanical fixtures are laid out along the ceiling and the buildings. So the lightning and mechanical fixtures are exposed in the two longer academic wings. Um, and then they seem to be covered with wooden panels in the central atria. Um, there appears to be the wood fluted ceiling in the central atria, so there are likely registers incorporated into the design for air circulation, as there are no visible like fans on the ceiling. Um, and then the building is made of concrete, which gives it a high fire resistance, and the concrete floors would keep fire separated between the floors, and then also sprinkler, sprinkler lines and smoke slash fire detection systems are present on the ceilings. Okay, um, from previously from looking at this, um, I did think that it appeared to be precast concrete um, used to construct the building. However, after getting feedback from Dan and kind of looking into it more, um, I do believe it is a lot of poured in place concrete just because there's no like major joints that we see on the connections. Um, and then lastly, so the building is facing east with lots of glazing, so it allows for a lot of sunlight, um, eastern sunlight in the morning. Um, natural, natural lighting is maximized throughout um, the whole building as there is an abundant amount of glazing on the north and south side of the building. And then there's also skylights and clear story in the central atrium. The glazing is framed by panels of finely perforated anodized aluminum, which enhances the sense of lightness. And then next, we just go through the calculations. So we did the tributary area for two of the columns, one interior and one exterior. And then we also have the live reduction load calculations there as well. And then next is just some images of some of the 3D base, uh, the model of the 3D base. And that's it. 
Okay, um, just a couple of observations, but I think, you know, thorough, you know, detail of a lot of the aspects of the work. Um, I mean, there was a reference to bolted and welded connections, but this is a concrete building. I'm not sure where the bolted or welded connections would be in place. Usually, uh, you know, if, in case of poured in place concrete, you have continuous members that, which have semi rigid connections. Um, so that would be something that you may want to think about those connection descriptors. Um, the the point I'm, I would make is that you said it was a brain building and so it was concerned about sustainability. Um, so was there any reference to green concrete or greening the concrete uh, in, in the material that you reviewed as well? And I guess my last question would be, what were your most interesting uh, points or aspects of the work? Um, I'd say one of the interesting things that I found about the building was how uh, the structure is pretty exposed. Like one of the goals was to kind of celebrate the structure of the building. And so there's also a lot of lighting strategies that kind of expose it and bring in a lot of lighting to um, expose like the laboratories and the workshops too, which isn't really common in workshop spaces. So I thought that was pretty interesting. All right. Okay, thank you. That's it for today at 7.25. Um, if there is anybody that wants to present on Wednesday, um, it didn't go yet, we can go ahead and try to catch some time for you. But please let me know at the beginning of class if you'd like to present. It's not a mandatory thing, but I think it's always useful for, for obviously the whole class and students to see what's going, what you've been working on and, and, and learn from that. So Thank you for this evening. I'm sorry about having to be off um, off campus today, but uh, should be back on campus without a problem on Wednesday and going forward, uh, not have to deal with quarantine issues from COVID. So stay well and have a good week. I will catch up with you on Wednesday. Good evening. Good evening.